and I really have the honor of introducing Brian Baird, a former Democratic U.S. Representative for the state of Washington's 3rd Congressional District, who served from 1999 to 2011. Brian Baird entered politics in 1998 for the same reason he went into the field of clinical psychology, to answer the call to service. As a congressman, Baird traveled to Gaza five times and was deeply disturbed by the destruction wrought by the Israel's relentless attacks on the besieged territory. He called for the U.S. to cut aid to Israel unless it lifted the blockade on Gaza. That air, land, and sea blockade has been ongoing for 14 years. As a healthcare professional, Brian Baird condemned official Israeli policies that make it really hard for Palestinians to receive or provide medical care. Representative Baird also called on the U.S. State Department to investigate the death of his constituent, Rachel Corey, a 23-year-old student who was crushed to death by an Israeli bulldozer in 2003. After leaving Congress, Baird served as president of Antioch University's Seattle campus until 2015 and contributes op-eds to the Seattle Times. Brian Baird will describe how Israel and its U.S. lobby assert authority over Congress, and he will recommend critical actions voters should take to help elect leaders who will study this issue in a fair and open-minded way. Thank you, Brian. Linda, thank you very much, and thank you to all the organizers and the people who are watching today and, and to our other speakers. Uh, I want to begin my remarks by stepping back for a little bit in history and to the early days of the uh, Gaza invasion, uh, which Israel called uh, Operation Cast Lead. A few days into that, there was a picture of uh, three little boys. And they, I, at the time, my wife and I just started our family kind of late, and we had two twin boys who were about three and a half. And there was a picture of three very small Palestinian boys laying down on a rug. And if you just glanced at it, you might think, oh, there's how precious that is. Those are wonderful little boys and they're sleeping. Except that when you look further at the picture, there was a father beside them with his head in his arms, in his hands, and in abject grief because those three little boys were dead. And they had been killed by an American-made munition dropped by an American-made aircraft by a country that we considered an ally. And when I saw that picture, I determined that I needed to go to Gaza personally. And I reached out to my dear friend, Keith Ellison, who was a, a former member of Congress, now the Secretary of State of Minnesota. Keith was thinking the same thing. And the two of us decided that the first chance we would get, we would go to Gaza. No American uh, elected officials had been to Gaza in eight years. And there were some incredibly courageous Americans working for UNRWA and other relief agencies, Mercy Corps and others in the field in the middle of the bombing. Uh, but we were the first Americans to go in, and John Kerry on a separate mission went in at the same time. When we got to Gaza, it was a dysphoric day. The wind was blowing, the sand was in the air, very cold, and the, there was a yellow uh, hue to the sky as the sand obliterated the, the light. And everywhere we looked, there were blown up and destroyed buildings. We visited water treatment facilities that had been destroyed. We visited sewage treatment plants that had been destroyed. We visited bread making factories that had been destroyed. We went to Al-Quds Hospital, at the top floor of Al-Quds Hospital. I'm a clinical neuropsychologist by training. And I work with people with disabilities and brain injuries. The top floor was this spectacularly beautiful uh, resource for young children. It had Disney characters on the wall. There was Goofy and Minnie, Minnie and Mickey Mouse, and there were pits full of the plastic balls that kids can play in and all the therapeutic tools you could imagine. A wonderful facility, except that it had been burned, almost just completely destroyed by white phosphorus bombs, which is contrary to international law, but white phosphorus bombs were dropped on a hospital or near enough to a hospital to incinerate that hospital and that resource for the kids. Keith and I visited uh, the mental health programs in Gaza where they talked about the trauma, if, if how it affects children to hear rockets and bombs and see tanks and see their parents being carted away without process constantly and wondering when they are gonna die or their parents are going to be killed. As you saw in the picture there, we also visited the American International School. 
This was a marvelous institution that taught an American curriculum. The kids were getting a fairly progressive education. They actually had been criticized the school by Hamas because they were considered too Western and too liberal. But it was an American-based curriculum in a lovely school, and it too had been destroyed, tragically taking the life of the watchman who had been there to try to secure it as best he could, but he couldn't secure anything against 500-pound bombs. In the rubble of the American school, Keith Ellison and I walked around, and I saw something that looked familiar in the rubble. And sure enough, I took out a book and it was a scholastic book. Now, anybody who knows American schools know that scholastic books are the books that they have book sales around. And these are a major resource for our kids in, in the US to read. As life would have it, that particular book I dug out was the Jackie Robinson story. The, first, the story of the first prominent black American baseball player. And I opened it up, it was a teacher's edition, and I knew that because it had lots of sticky notes, marking things, and I just randomly opened it up, and there was a passage that was highlighted, and the teacher's sticky note said, what about this passage teaches you the meaning of prejudice? That was in the rubble of the American school, and how fitting to connect that today to our discussion of apartheid. And I especially want to compliment uh, the brilliant Susan Ab Wahawa for her uh, insightful presentation, summarizing the parallels between apartheid in South Africa and what unquestionably goes on in Israel today. I say unquestionably because it's, if you question it all, you get criticized as our prior speaker, Walter Hickson just pointed out and have others. But you know, finding that book in the rubble of Gaza was not the first time I had seen American weapons and American equipment used against civilians. Six years prior to that, a wonderful young constituent of mine named Rachel Corey was crushed to death beneath American-made bulldozer for the audacious act of standing in front of the bulldozer to try to save a Palestinian home from destruction. They drove a bulldozer over her, put the blade down, backed, back up over top of her, and scarcely cared about what happened to her. When I tried to launch an investigation of this, and introduced a congressional resolution. We were st steadily blocked initially by Israel, by our own State Department, and to a large degree, with some notable and courageous exceptions, I will say. There were some members of the State Department who did their level best to help us out, and I commend them. But within the Congress, there was instead of support, here's a member of Congress whose constituent has been killed by an ally and is simply requesting an investigation. In support, a counter resolution was offered calling for an investigation of Americans who died due to terrorist attacks. And everyone flooded to that, but no, scarcely half dozen or so people signed on to the investigation of Rachel Corey and Israel stonewalled it. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. So you might say, well, how can this happen? An instructive lesson comes from what happened to the Goldstone report. Justice Goldstone, as many of you know, a distinguished South African jurist, Jewish individual, uh, was commissioned to conduct an investigation of Operation Cast Lead. I read his report twice, front to back, the entire thing, and found it thoroughly consistent with what Keith and I had seen, not only on one visit to Gaza, but we made multiple visits to Gaza and to the West Bank. And for the record, we also visited the Israeli city of Sderot and other villages that had been rocketed from Gaza ro launch rockets as well. So we tried to get an understanding of the full spectrum of the situation there as best we could. When the Goldstone report came out, almost immediately, there was a resolution introduced into the US Congress to condemn the report. When that vote came to the floor, first of all, many of us said, well, let's invite Justice Goldstone to come to Congress to explain his report. Perhaps not surprisingly, that offer was not taken up. When the vote came to the floor, I went to the floor and said something to the effect of the following. Many of my colleagues today are about to come to this well of this House of Representatives and vote on a resolution that they have never read about a report that they have re never read and about a place that they have never been. And yet most people who do that will not speak, seek to ask any of us who have been there, have read the report, have seen the evidence, what it really means. Sure enough, once the vote was called, members of Congress came to the floor of the House, and we vote with little cards. We sit, stick it in an electronic slot. We press yes, no, or present. 
right? You come in and people look up at the board, which il il illustrates what the content of the current vote is. And you could hear people saying, APAC wants a yes on this vote. Why yes? Because the vote was on condemning this, uh, this report that people hadn't read. People wouldn't necessarily would say what's in the report, what happened in Gaza, what is the resolution itself? They would just nod their head once they heard APAC was for it and they would vote yes on the resolution. There were many, a couple, three dozen, I believe, courageous members of Congress who voted no on the resolution, which is incredibly fraught with risk as an elected official in America. And on top of that, there were several others who just uh, did not attend the proceedings that day. But what does that tell you? What it tells you is members of Congress are willing to vote on things they haven't read simply because an advocacy group tells them to vote that way. Even if what was done and what was being condemned by the resolution is contrary to American values and American foreign policy and domestic policy interests. One of the other things that I found remarkable in this experience was what happens when you confront members of the Israeli government with the evidence of the atrocities that have been committed in Gaza and also the abuses of human rights within the West Bank and within Israel proper against Palestinian residents of Israel. What I found was fascinating. The initial response of many Israelis, both domestically, uh, or pro-Israeli advocates domestically, and I'm gonna talk about that word pro-Israel in just a second. But the initial response is to assume that members of Congress must all support Israel because after all, that's what we're assumed that we should do. But it's not just assumed that we all support Israel, it is assumed we will do so without question. We will just take what we're told at face value, accept it and vote as we are told or asked in polite terms uh, without questioning and without disagreement. If you begin to question, some interesting things happen. You are often looked at in somewhat of a condescending patronizing way as if you just don't understand the issue. So then, sort of counter, counter uh, so-called evidence will be presented against what your question was about. But if you've really studied it and you're able to say, you know, I've heard that argument before, but the evidence here says something else. Having been to Gaza, having been to the West Bank, we had a perspective that most members didn't. So then there's a kind of a sense of, well, there are other sides to the story and perhaps there are things you're unaware of. Often in a condescending way, you're just not informed, you're just misguided, it will all work out. If you continue to press, something deeply troubling happens. If you press hard enough on many people within the Israeli administration, you encounter something rather shocking, disdain. Disdain not just for those of us asking the question, but disdain for the United States of America itself. Disdain in several ways. One, look, what Israel does is no worse than what you did. You had launched a genocide against the tribes, we can do what we want to do. Listen, you don't understand. You don't understand the Holocaust. You don't understand what the neighborhood we're in. So don't tell us what to do. Literally the tone of voice takes the kind of tone of voice I'm using. And the rhetoric is often harsher than that. And the consistent message is implicitly, we are happy to take your money, lots of it, billions of dollars a year, and we're happy to take your weapons, but don't you dare question anything we do. That is the underlying tone, and it is a disdain for America. And to be honest, to a portion, that disdain is justified. And why is it justified? Because the Israeli government knows, and its advocates in the United States know, that they can control members of Congress. And that is something possibly worthy of disdain. How do they control this? This is not pleasant to say, and I'm sorry to say it. I, as an American, as a patriot, as a person who represents this country and took an oath to defend the constitution, I am profoundly sorry to say this. But you can categorize some of the things that guide decisions in Congress. They all begin with M. And the first M is money. Anybody who says that money helps influence outcomes of votes regarding Israel is immediately branded anti-Israeli or anti-Semitic, both or worse. That's not true. It's just simply reality. Enormous amounts of money come into American political campaigns. Specific events are held where members of Congress are invited to express their fealty to Israel. I've had it happen that I know people who supported me and on almost every major domestic issue, we were consonant. 
How did they feel about uh, the environment, pro-environmental protection? How did they feel about women's rights and women's health? We're on, consistent with that. How did we feel about education opportunities? How did we feel about domestic issues? But for having stood up and asked for an investigation into the death slash murder of my constituent at the hands of an Israeli bulldozer driver, those same people who supported me on almost every other issue then no longer supported me financially in my reelection campaigns because I asked for the investigation of a constituent had been murdered by our allies. So the first M is money. The second M is mythology. People believe almost unquestioning the sort of David and Goliath myth, the, the beleaguered Israelis being besieged by all the Arab nations. But first of all, the Palestinians are, are not all the Arab nations. And on top of that, there's, there's a, a willful ignorance uh, if you will, a, a wolf, another M, uh, an intentional myopia or intentional misunderstanding of what's actually happening on the ground. I took one colleague to the region as, we, as he heard the difficult issues about Israeli detention of youths without legal representation, without due process, in the middle of the night, taken from their homes and taken to detention centers with, without any due process. As he heard these and he heard about the abuse of the Palestinians, the, the confiscation and destruction of, of olive groves, the, 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 the sharpshooters assassinating peaceful protesters in Gaza, the, the, the blockade, the kind of things that, that we've heard about so eloquently before, he was overwhelmed with the reality that was con disconsonant with the mythology he had come to believe and he just couldn't accept it. There was almost a mental breakdown at a moment of, wait a minute, if all you're saying is true, then my unquestioning un acceptance of Israeli policy is problematic. So then there's another M and I think that's malfeasance. If a member of Congress unquestioningly supports something a lobby asked for, and part of the calculus is the financial contribution of the lobby, that's malfeasance. Your first and most important priority is what's consistent with the United States Constitution and what is consistent with the values of our country. And I will tell you the actions of Israel and the policies that Susan raised earlier are not consistent with our constitution and not in our best interest. And on that front, let me say, we should never use the words pro-Israel lobby because the actions of people who demand unquestioning obedience to Israel, even when its policies are anti-democratic, anti-human rights, inconsistent with our interests, they are also not pro-Israel because it is not good for Israel to engage in this kind of behavior. We cannot call it pro-Israel to unblindingly accept policies that are counterproductive, counter our own constitution and counter international law and respect for human rights. And finally, there's another M which is shocking to me. It's millenarianism, meaning the belief that we must support Israel in order to bring about the biblical end of times at which point the, virtually all the Jewish people as well as non-believing non-Jewish people will burn in hell forever while a small select group of people, evangelical Christians in this model and the few Jews who convert to uh, evangelicism will suddenly be whisked off to heaven. Believe it or not, a portion of the United States Congress bases its domestic and foreign policy around a desire to see the end of the world occur, at which time Jewish people, non-Christians and others burn in hell forever. Well, those people go to heaven. How ironic it is that if in our country you say, do you know what, money influences American politics, that is considered anathema and something you should never say. But if you say our politics should lead to the end of the world, that's perfectly fine. And it is somehow, used to defend whatever Israel wants to do. Let me close with a couple of thoughts and then we're happy to take some questions. First of all, while I am strong in my belief that we have to be critical about Israeli policy, we haven't spoken about it in this conference yet today, but there are many other countries in the region who are also richly deserving of opprobrium, disdain, criticism, and investigation. That includes Saudi Arabia and it includes Iran. Iran has sponsored state terrorism. Iran has wickedly abused human rights, especially the rights of women, as has Saudi Arabia. And while we must criticize Israel, we must also be equally ardent 
in our criticism and review of the policies of these other nations, by the way, in the case of Saudi Arabia, which also re receives prodigious amounts of American military assistance. So flaws with Israel, the apartheid state cannot be expanded and must be reversed, but we also have to deal with other problems within the region. And with that, I wanna stop. Thank you for the chance to chat with you. I'm happy to take questions along with Walter. Thank you so much, Brian Baird. You've explained exactly what happens in Congress better than anyone I've ever heard before. And we've asked members of Congress if in the cloakrooms, members actually show more support for Palestinians than their votes show. And now I'm thinking they don't, <laughs> or not some, many of them do. Some do, many do actually, but they haven't heard. If they could hear Susan's testimony and really listen to it and compare what she said earlier today with the tenets of the United States Constitution, unlawful search and seizure, non-official establishment of a religion, free speech, et cetera, they would realize we are supporting a country that is passing laws that should never be passed in the United States. We're not only supporting, we're giving them billions of dollars and military hardware that is then used against innocent civilians. 